Welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar on why Enable Backup is this MSP Partners standard. Before we get going, we have a little bit of legal jargon that we need to show, which basically just indicates that there is some, there may be some forward-looking statements and that does not represent a legal commitment on our part. So I'd like to start by introducing our panelists today. We have got two folks presenting. We have Dan Mitchell, who is the CEO of Alt Tech, which is one of our managed IT service partner, uh, managed IT service provider partners. And he's going to be chatting with Chris Groot, who's one of our vice presidents here at Enable. As you may have noticed, all attendees are on mute right now, but that doesn't mean that we don't wanna hear from you. So please do use the Q&A panel to ask any questions that you may have, and we'll deal with them as we get going here. Ask those questions as they occur to you, and we'll answer them before we finish up here. And do let us know in the chat panel if you have any audio or video issues so that we can try to remedy those. And finally, this session is being recorded. So I mentioned All that right. Daniel is, that my is with Alt Tech. Go right ahead, Chris, and take it away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, great stuff. Um, I'm just going to end this show here and stop showing my screen. Did that stop showing yet? Oh, I'm frozen. Yeah. I'm sorry here. I can't. Uh, my like my screen is just frozen temporarily here. Looks look fine, fine to us. Okay, Where well then let's... Going? Yep. Perfect. All right, Dan. Good start, hey? Um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to kick off just by uh, getting to know, really, first of all, thank you for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. Um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to chat. And I uh, wanted to kick off by just asking a few questions, just maybe give uh, the folks in the audience just a, a sense of, about a bit about um, Alttech, its history, when you started, um, what, how many employees you have, types of customers you serve. You know, just give a, a general sense of the, the overall business. Yeah, 100 percent. Alltech started in 2006. That's our incorporation date. Um, it did sit shelved a little bit as most people kind of uh, don't start MSPs straight out of the gate. They kind of uh, either do it as a side hustle or a job. And Alltech started the same way. We started, you know, out of the basement as a side hustle while I worked uh, full time for the federal government. Um, and then in 2011, that's when things really separated. I decided to make the leap of faith. I resigned my position within the federal government and alt tech really became full blown. So from um, 2011 to now, we now have 23 employees. Um, we have a little over 86 um, managed service clients. Um, so it's been a growth year over year, as you can imagine from 2011 to now, um, we've done a lot of building the business. So that's kind of how we started and where we are now. And we've done the whole basement game and transitioned our way up into the, uh, the offices we have now with the staff complement we have now. Awesome. That is an amazing story. Mm -hmm. um, getting to that size is, uh, I'm sure, not without its challenges along the way. <laughs> um, and what what's your role now in the company now that you've reached this level? What kind of things are you focused on? Um, you know, I do a lot more steering, um, a lot more strategic development with our client base. Um, I enjoy the VCIO role for our clients. So I really do enjoy looking at the way they're using technology in their specific industries and then finding better solutions for them to make them more efficient. And that's been the primary focus I've been doing while building the team and of course still steering everything. Great. And uh, still having fun? Oh, yeah. Every day's uh, a challenge. And like every MSP knows, they wake up in the morning and who knows what that day is going to present, right? So there is no there is no dull day. Awesome. What, what about uh, any, anything uh, you need just to kind of the audience getting to know you outside of the business? Like, uh, curious just to know, uh, what do you do besides uh, technology that keep, you know fills your interests? Well, I am that typical uh, tech geek to business owner, which is not always the easiest transition. You know, most of us started out 
fingers on keyboards and uh, that transition to business owner is a little tricky, but I am a geek at heart, you know, I drink and I know things. And that comes from a little bit of, uh, I'm a certified whiskey ambassador. So I do a lot of whiskey tastings. Actually, you can see in the background a little bit of uh, some of the whiskeys that we kind of deal with. But so outside of work, you got to do something to blow off steam. And that is uh, between whiskey and martial arts. Those are the two kind of uh, worlds that I live in that aren't related to technology. When the door closes, I try and not touch a computer as much as humanly possible. Awesome. Ah, good for you. <laughs> well, uh, we are here to talk a little bit about backup. So mm -hmm. I was kind of curious to maybe kick off on that topic uh, by just asking an open question. Uh, that I'd like to ask you if you could talk about your your beliefs about backup and disaster recovery. Like you carry a responsibility to your customers. Um, and so what, what are your like, kind of core beliefs about what's right for them? You know, I've spent a lot of time in backup as not necessarily being the core of, of our business model, um, but it's definitely one of the pillars. And I think that hold true, holds true with most MSPs. And like most MSPs, I started the same way everyone did. You know, you chase the cash flow, you put the solutions in, you can. Um, and what that means is that when you first start out, you end up doing things like using open source solutions and you start then, okay, okay, that didn't necessarily work the way you kind of planned. It didn't scale right. Then you kind of realize that you're still the one on the hook. If that solution fails, there's nobody to go to. Uh, so a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of verifications, validations that are all being done uh, manually and stuff like that. Okay. So then you move into, you know, maybe one of the bottom end backup solution providers. Um, and then you realize that that doesn't necessarily cover all the variables you require. And then you move up from there and you start to transition up. And one of the things that we've really learned is that a good backup solution doesn't mean a good backup solution for an MSP. There are a ton of great backup solutions out there, but they're enterprise. And in our world with multi-tenancy, that's a problem. So multi-tenancy is the key for us for efficiency. As you heard me mention, we're 23 technicians. And even if you're three technicians, or even if you're, you're working in the basement and you're bringing on your first technician, every time you do that, every time you have to do that training, if it doesn't scale, it's going to cost you money. So whatever you think you're saving, you're actually spending. So, and how does that relate to the client base? It means that if you have a product that you're not comfortable in, like if you're not 100% confident is going to perform the, perform the job, you need to take a hard look at why you're using that product. And if it's just based off of a cost perspective or some niche piece of functionality, that has to be looked at, in my opinion, because um, all of our revenue is generated out of efficiency now. So efficiency is key, which means I need a single pane of glass. I need it to work. I need it to be validated that it's going to work. And I need it to be easy for my technicians to use. So that's a big thing for us. And all that means, if that takes place, if my technicians are happy, that means the client's going to get what they need. So that's kind of where we've kind of come to. And and for the, for the clients, do you set any like specific expectations around, you know, frequency of backups or how do you describe the service that you deliver to them um, in terms of them understanding the value that they're, they're paying for as part of your service? Oh, hundred percent. Like we actually have it all broken out into our standard MSAs. We have marketing documents around it, but realistically what we've found that happens and it doesn't matter if it's a 10 seat client or a 300 seat client. What we've found is that our word is becomes our bond. And if we're, we only engage in partnerships. So we don't do that vendor client relationship type scenario. Um, so everything we do is partnership based. And what we find happens is that they just want to know that backups occur. The, the actual nitty gritty of, well, what's the return to operation? What's the re recovery point objective? All of those things are technology that we in the industry use that I have found that clients really don't care about. What right. they want to know is that when I have a failure or if I have a if I have a, a, a file or a server go down, will you get it operational? 
So it really comes um, to the metal when you do that first recovery, that's when you're gonna be judged by the client as to the success or failure of what you promised. So everything else on paper yeah. is kind of uh, tricky up until that point. For sure. So, so it sounds like you've been on a bit of a journey. You mentioned open source, and then oh, yeah. it sounds like you, if, uh, if you learn the lesson of uh, uh, software that might not be focused on the you know, specific needs of the MSP, um, just kind of curious to hear maybe some more of the specifics of that journey as you went along, what you, what you tried, um, what you tested, and, and kind of some of the ups and downs or pitfalls uh, uh, that you ran into along the way. Yeah, like we've done everything from getting Synologies and other devices like that, along with um, volume shadow copy products that use those to back up offsite and or not even offsite, but even to a storage array. Um, and then you end up spending 1.7 FTE full-time bodies just managing backup. And and it's, oh, this VSS error conflicted with an SQL VSS backup, so it failed. And because of it, you only had it running one time a night. So we had backup technicians that were just dedicated to staring at screens. And the first, you know, four hours of a morning was spent, you know, reverse engineering these and finding out what was going on. And then you go into the next solution and okay, maybe the next provider provided a little bit of support, but their familiarity with the complexity of an MSP environment with so many different servers, again, not an enterprise solution. The multi-tenancy is a huge piece of the pie that a lot of the backup providers miss. And it's because you could have one server back in the day, 2008 to 2012, one could have SQL, QuickBooks, remote desktop, each one of these required a different way of using and uh, analyzing what the best process for backup was. But again, that was still our responsibility as an MSP and that was still our backup technician's responsibility. And then as you transition, you're like, okay, well that didn't work. Oh, well, we'll go into this solution. It's a really good, well-known enterprise solution. And I'm a big fan of it. You know, it's done, it's per performed miracles but no pane of glass and no multi-tenancy. So now what happens is it's still technically one FTE plus the billing nightmare of, okay, well, they're using more storage, they're using less storage. Okay, they have five endpoints, I think, but I can only get an email as to a success or failure about it. So you're still not being as efficient as you can. And when you get to the size of multiple technicians, you start to realize you don't wanna keep paying FTEs to make up an inefficiencies in software or process. So that was the big aha moment for us is that, you know, our 20, 2019 to 2021 objectives have been efficiency gains. So we're, we're kind of done hiring a technician to, to fill a, a horrible process or a horrible product, right? So we've kind of fixed all of that. And that was a big decision about Enable was the single pane of glass and not just across our server base, uh, and our virtual servers, but also our Office 365 infrastructure. As I'm sure many can uh, attest, the adoption of cloud has been huge, but Office 365 transitions, you know, we got we got a little bit beat up over exchange vulnerabilities last year, right? So there was a mass exodus of on-prem exchange into Office 365 if those weren't already in middle transition at that point. So the Office 365 backup being into the same multi-tenancy portion where I can look at something and instantly know what I should be billing was huge. Because billing still falls into the administrative side, not the technician side. So my, my front end staff are now having to deal with inefficiencies in a product as well. So that was a big relief to us as well. Yeah, I love to focus on the, uh, the efficiencies. Um, and, uh, and so maybe uh, if you take us back a, a few months uh, to say, to, to give us a picture of like, you were using some other products. I'm, I'm not even sure which ones. Um, and uh, and like you go in 2019, 2020, you're looking for efficiencies. Um, you know, what did you discover as you went out to look at how to solve the labor issue? Um, and I and I assume it's fair to say that labor is your biggest expense, and that's why you're focused there. Yeah, and it's so much worse than that, right? So, um, not only did we have a little bit of a shattering of, of not having confidence in our backup product. At one point in time, prior to moving to Enable, is that 
we had three backup products running at the same time because we had zero trust. So we actually had volume shadow copy services running on the server. We had an image level being done for the server. And then we had a file level backup being taking place. And it's because we ran into a scenario where an event occurred and we weren't happy with a number of the backup situations at that time, not just the software, there was a support issue, there was a, a, a code red type scenario that wasn't being addressed. Um, so that was what really led us to kind of go, okay, you know, if I'm not sleeping at night and my technicians are stressed and as a company, one of our core values is family, which is something you don't normally see in a, in an enterprise family being a core value. And it is. So when my technicians get stressed about something, um, I start to get my back up a little bit and because that's how you end up in turnover and churn and all sorts of other issues um, and efficiency. You, you lose efficiency. If they're stressed and they don't want to deal with it, they don't want to open that email in the morning to find out what their day looks like. That's a problem. So that led us to survey the field um, for something that had a couple very key requirements and it was backup first. The backup product had to be solid. The second being it had to be multi-tenancy. The third, it had to support everything we had in our environment. And we evaluated roughly five to seven-ish. I, I evaluated five, my team evaluated two. Um, and realistically, we narrowed it down and in the end, Enable ended up being our solution, so. And, and what were some of the things you, you saw by way of comparison that like, uh, or, or like what light bulbs went off with what you saw uh, with Enable Backup versus um, some of the other five that you're looking at? You know, I can appreciate like most, um, there is a portion of evaluation when you're evaluating software. Is it easy to use and does it look appeasing and so on and so forth. But I can also tell um, Alttech is a group of companies and in there we have a software development company. So we're not very unfamiliar with what can be done in a software development. You might have a very uh, a software development company, like a backup company that has a strong UI team, right? Their UX team is just on the point, right? Like everything looks where it's supposed to be, it's easy to navigate, it's intuitive. But unfortunately, if you put that on a backup product that doesn't work, <laughs> you're not really getting what you're paying for, right? So we came across a, a bunch of those where key pieces were done really well, but the backup part was suffering. And if you don't have the backup portion solid, the rest doesn't really matter. So one of the things that won us over with SolarWinds was that they focused, and I can tell that the backup product was designed first and it was designed well, and then everything else was built on to do the service offering, the you know the user interface, the security, the permissions, and everything else. But the backup was focused on first, and that was a big key for us. I don't want to get in an emergency situation and have to go, oh no, here we go, click, is it gonna work? I don't want that type stress, right? So that's something we're not interested in, and, and that was something that we, the other ones weren't able to convince us that that was wasn't going to happen. Yeah, great. Well, and and to that end, uh, I guess uh, the other way of becoming a little more comfortable with that, you know, that phone call coming, let's say, is uh, is testing. What do you guys do from a, a testing perspective, and and what's kind of your philosophy on that? Yeah. So in the in all of our past, because we didn't trust a bunch of the backup solutions, what would happen is we had a form that we would actually email out to the clients once a month and that we'd have them pick a file, right? So they would pick a file, they would write it down into this form and submit it back to our, our rapid response team, which is our part of our infrastructure team. And we would restore that file, attach that file back to that email and send it back to them, kind of as a proof of concept, hey, look, we were able to restore that file from the date you chose, so on and so forth, right? Big convoluted process. Um, with the screen testing and the the validation portion in in, in solar winds um, that's not necessarily disappeared but we're not making that as public facing as we used to because of the fact that we're doing a bunch of things like the client we can get a copy of the screenshot boot up effect and all those types of things the power on tests which helps again like i mentioned if my uh, technicians are stressed um, that's not a good thing for me. And I, I evaluate that against every product. So them seeing those Windows login screens, the validation testing on a set schedule, 
um, it's a quick glance. They can see the total percentage of successes and failures or in progresses with not even drilling into anything. They can just see it immediately off the hop. And now they know that their day has gone from, you know, seven hours of troubleshooting backups to 30 minutes of, uh, oh yeah, it failed at one o'clock, but the two o'clock was successful. I don't really care. So it's fine. Right. So, so, um, with, uh, so in terms of your, your, your employees, so we touched on that, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, the, the, the one, you, I think you mentioned 1.7 FTE, um, but what's kind of that before, like, a, if we think about profitability and efficiency, just from like the business owner perspective, how would you describe kind of the before and after of like time you were spending and total cost of delivering the service, you know, including your labor kind of before. And if you look at that today, now that you've made the transition, uh, you know, roughly, I think it was like six or eight months ago, you made that move. Um, what's been, have you made any, you know, notable, uh, you know, differences on, on your profitability and, oh, and just how the business sure. is running? 100%. Um, and that's, and a lot of that has to do with complexities in SharePoint and Office 365 backup. So um, the 1.7 was actually just related to server and physical hardware. The Office 365 was a portion that um, was a big black hole to us because it was done by a completely different product. Um, right. So the time spent on that product was uh, a little bit shared between our tier two team and our infrastructure team uh, and the process around it was a little clunky. So um, the total expenditure for hours was 1.7 was just to make sure that the daily backups were kind of running. You know, and that sounds really high, but when you're talking the amount of servers we're looking after, we're looking a little over 375 servers that we're ma managing and maintaining currently. Um, it kind of makes sense when you put it in that perspective. And that 1.7 is just the preventative maintenance, never mind the time to actually deal with a, a restore or a recovery or disaster type scenario. So, and, and Office 365. So I know for a fact that my, my after hours team is now doing about maybe 30 minutes a day for backups. And that 30 minutes includes a summary email that our infra our night infrastructure team summarizes to our morning infrastructure team about what happened overnight. So out of 30 minutes, portion of that is taking screen shares and that's just the, the internal communication that our team has. Um, but that's, you know, that's taking that into effect. And I know that includes Office 365, which was um, shrinkage in my actual operational expenditure because it's a number I didn't know. I, I had no associated loss of time related to Office 365, which means even scarier, I don't even know if it was being monitored at, properly at that point, right? right. So, um, and again, if you find out that you didn't have a backup when you when you need to do a restore, that's the wrong time to find out that your backups aren't running. Right. <laughs> and that's how, how many MSPs sit there and go into a client saying, going, oh, you have backups running, or at least you think you do. When's the last time a restore was done? And everyone goes, ah, but when you end up actually still denying or not following through on that promise as an MSP, that's a, that's a hard broken rule, right? So. Yeah, that's outstanding. Um, just in terms of the, the, the time impact and, and um, huge, you know, sounds like that's, uh, if you're, if you're gaining days that are like going from, you know, 1.7 down to less than 30 minutes. And, and part of that is even some separate admin time. Well, then, and that uh, one point, and that one point severs in, in, in the infrastructure team, right? So it's your highest paid, you know, employees doing the least revenue generating tasks usually, right? Yeah. But well, that sounds uh, pretty impactful. Um, yeah, it's huge. It's great, great to hear. I mean, that that is the the mission is to uh, you know inject the efficiency and eliminate the time while still providing the peace of mind. Um, it, uh, what about the um, just talk about like hiring people, maintain, uh, keeping your good people um, and and the impact of having like a, like this set of tools versus kind of that combination of, you know, three different, three separate backup products, how you used to run it. What, what's the impact on your staff and, and kind of their perspective and, and job satisfaction? It, it, does that measure it into does the equation very much? It 100% does. Like I mentioned, the tech stress is real. Um, 
you, the last thing you want is your infrastructure team or members of your team having headaches, migraines, because you know they're staring at screens for extended period of time, but under stressful situations. And backup is one of those, right? Um, backup is one of the ones like, you know, if you have to patch something or, you know, there's a support call or you're putting a network switch in, that has a beginning, a middle and an end. The impact of not having a backup is gonna come out of you at left field on a Tuesday at 6 a.m. So there's always a stress if you don't know or you don't have confidence in your backup product, that's the one, I always ask my technicians in our, in our infrastructure calls, I'm like, what's the black hole? What's the deep, dark fear you have today? And I could tell you a year ago, over just over a year ago, when I would ask that question, they'd be like, I'm worried about backups. I'm worried about, you know, I'm worried about us not having transparency or viewability into the, the backups and whether or not they are or are not succeeding. Um, and I still, I continue to ask that question and that has been removed. So that, that has been shifted to something else that we now have to tackle. Right. But I always ask my team, what's the what's the deep, dark thing that keeps you up at night? And that's a great question to ask your teams, um, because I can tell you it's going to it's going to reveal things that you might think as a CEO or owner or operations manager that you have under control. But if you're projecting what you have control of to your team, they're not going to be honest with you. And if they come back at you, I can guarantee you that if your backup solution is not on par, I can tell you they're probably going to share with you that that that's going to. That's something keeping them up at night. Yeah. So um, then, from a from a pure technology perspective, as you as you dug into things, you, you mentioned um, one of the interesting things you mentioned. I thought was the uh, they're using both like a file based and an image based solution. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Image based tends to be like you know, local first at a minimum. Sometimes uh, uh, you know it used to get off site and so on. Um, it, when you discovered enable backup, um, did, did your perspective change on that requirement? And and like, was there anything that surprised you that you just you didn't think that's how technology or how backup software would work? No, we. I, I mean, like I said, we've been before before enable. We ended up in probably seven different backup solutions, all the way from you know shadow copy, um, way back in the day, you know, to open source uh, and um using you know synologies and QNAPs to back up to um all the way through you know msp 360 veeam datto you know we've been through every backup product you can probably imagine again why because when i ask the question to my team what's the thing that keeps you up at night and they answer backup well i'm not going to stay with that right so we have to find the right solution and, and i'm not too sure why it took us so long to come to the to the table of enable solution um but it hit us at a at a not bad time right we're expanding at such a rate and you know it was easier to onboard technicians it was very easy to transition from that previous backup solution into 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 enable it that transition took a very minimalistic amount of time um, our onboarding we were basically given an, a certain amount of time to try to transition as much of our client base into enable as we could we were well under that timetable. Like we, I think we were 30 days or 45 days and I think we did it in 15, right? And it cost 375 servers, not including desktops and the Office 365. It didn't take us long to transition into there. So that was a, that was a very impactful thing for us. Um, but so like just I said, repeat, just, yeah. did I hear that correct? The, the whole transition you were expecting like 45 days and you did it in about 15? We was, did it in 15, yeah. And, and that was a, that was a mix between some automation deployment through our RMM, um, yeah. and it was a little bit of handholding for some of our more complex environments. But we had never been able to transition our 400-ish server base through the seven backup products I told you before in 15 days. That was that was huge. So I got my 1.7 back into infrastructure in a half a month cycle. So that's very impactful revenue-wise. Yeah, that's great. Um, almost pays for itself at that point. <laughs> well paid for itself at that point, yeah. Um, well, that's just great. So so if you were, I guess, uh, with that journey you've been on, I guess what advice would you have for other MSPs out there? Um, it, it, you know, with that, like knowing that you've had this experience with Veeam, which a lot of people, that's sort of their gold standard. and 
and some people are very dedicated in the like a data world and you know and others have made you know similar choices in terms of you know appliance or, or image based solutions out there you know, what would be your insight into the journey you've been on that you think would be you know most helpful for other people that are trying to scale their business and build more efficiency more profitability into it yeah i think that one is a, is a tricky lesson it's a great question but it's a tricky response and the reason why is, is that most people chase their cash flow right so they put products in place that they can afford um, my my recommendation would be invest in your msp right so invest in solutions that are going to return you revenue and have that faith that that's what's going to happen right so if you invest in a product a person or a company um there, there's an expected return on that and what happens is is that if you're chasing your cash flow still where you're only implementing solutions that you know give you that immediate um roi like immediate roi um, and you're not taking a holistic view of what it costs to actually implement that solution. Um, I think that's the key is take a look at the holistic view of what the dollar value is of the product, but what it means to your, your staffing costs. What does it mean to your turnaround for the co client commitment you've given and what's keeping your team up at night? I think those are the four things that I would look at um, with, I would probably start with what's keeping my team up at night. Again, alt text core values is family. If my family's stressed, I can tell you that I'm stressed. And if I'm stressed, I can tell you that we're not delivering the best product, right? So if a, you can find a product and a partner that does that, that they remove that stress, you're going to not just make money on that product in the delivering that service. You're going to get that time back from your technicians to make you more profitable. So invest in your technicians, invest in the product and um, make sure that you have the right product. And yeah, like I said, lots of great solutions out there, but an enterprise solution is not an MSP solution. So you really need multi-tenancy. You need something that is in channel specific for MSPs, and that's going to help you on your billing, your training, your adoption, your deployment, and that's going to help you out revenue-wise, for sure. Love it. Well, uh, that's sort of, I, I guess, the bulk of the questions that I really had. Um, Carrie, was there, did we have any questions coming in while we were chatting here? Yeah, somebody's asking if um, there's any specific examples where you had to sort of save the day with maybe ransomware or something and, and how did this product perform in that situation in the real world? Yeah, we, we actually have, uh, I've got three really good examples. Um, one is we did have a ransomware. Now, Alt Tech is a cybersecurity and IT management company. So the ransomware was mitigated extremely quickly and it was limited to a user's profile directory on a server from Boulder redirection. But our our recovery time for restoring that file using um, Speed Vault was basically, I think, 15 minutes we had the entire directory restored. My second example is a much more severe example. We had a double hard drive failure in a physical server. Um, now, as most MSPs probably know right now, getting hardware sucks. Like if you order a server today, you'll be lucky to get it in the near future. But we have a data center. So we were actually able to take that restore from a, a client's physical on-prem server and we restored it into our data center, into our clustered environment. And we just set up a VPN point to point. So we basically took what would have been potentially weeks if not months recovery into a matter of a day and a half so we we're able to restore services with no hardware being procured nothing we were able to use the entire solar winds product to do that restore and recovery so that's a that's that's another great example office 365 example is we had a client um, uh, maliciously leave a company they were in the they were in a sales and marketing role and they basically thought that they were super smart they deleted everything then they went into the deleted items and actually deleted from there um but you know 10 minutes later we've got the entire mailbox recovered from two hours ago so not as smart as they thought they were so and, and again that makes big impactful differences there was multiple um, pipeline channel leads for that company equaling like 1.3 million dollars in incoming sales that were potentially lost from that salesperson leaving that role, that that pipeline would have disappeared. 
So it was very impactful for them. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, the, those Microsoft 365 stories are, um, well, let's just, some people are, I guess there's different views on it out there. Some people are really convicted on it. Um, some people are not so sure, um, but uh, certainly a story like that makes it pretty clear that uh, having that in place. Well, Michael, uh, Microsoft did a great job when they first released Office 365 in, in their narrative about, um, well, it's in the cloud, so it's backed up. And to this date, years later, we're still walking into uh, environments that are transitioning their MSP or um, on-prem IT solutions, and we're telling them, you don't actually have an Office 365 backup. And they just kind of go, what? <laughs> like, I'm sorry? And they don't understand that Office 365 doesn't actually include backup. They've just, at some point in time through their journey, assumed that that was taking place, and it's not. So that's always a fun conversation to have. Yeah, and do you just roll that out then as a standard requirement with your customers? Oh yeah, so years ago we decided that um, one of the things people have to understand is you're, they're never gonna get the opportunity to defend themselves to the public, right? So what happens is being a, a managed IT provider means that there's an expectation from the client that we're, you're providing a level of service. If a client decides to say no to something that you're proposing to help them protect their environment, then that ends up being the chink in their armor and they end up you know, either having downtime, loss of revenue, loss of reputation. Somebody's gonna ask them, well, what happened? Well, who's your IT provider? And they're gonna point the finger squarely at you, but you're never gonna get the chance to defend yourself against that. So a number of years ago, we have a standardization stack that is non-negotiable and um, enable is one of the pillars of that stack because we know that reputationally we can't defend ourselves against a client that's going to say well we had a backup uh, failure and it, it caused us a weak outage and we'll never get to defend ourselves on that portion so the easiest solution was we have a standardized stack enable is one of those pillars and it's not optional so it's just because of the reputational risk and actually we explain it very clearly like that and they have no problems they understand every client i've ever talked to is like not a problem we understand like i'd rather have it and not maybe understand it or need it but they understand that's part of the partnership portion right so yep absolutely that's great and and that uh that fit that server example you had there uh the middle one um which sounded like uh quite a disastrous so was that a physical server that you recovered as a, a virtual machine in your in Correct. your data center then is that kind yeah, of the process that is a, that's exactly right it was a physical server that had a double raid failure um due to a, a thunderstorm that came through last year um and we did a restore into our data center into our virtual environment into our cluster and actually they never moved back <laughs> they're like i'm not buying a server i'll just pay you for hosting and we're just going to run it off there so yeah, and that's the, that's the important thing for the audience, like in terms of, you know, unique aspects, like the ease at which you can take a physical server like that, you know, recover it into a virtualized environment. Um, no appliances or, you know, other fancy gear required. Um, well, we've we've done shift and lifts using SolarWinds now, too. So we've actually done transitions where the server is a known age, it's out of warranty, but for some reason they decided at some point in time to upgrade to 2016 or 2019 but they're on 11 year old hardware. So we've right. done shift and lifts where we've actually used SolarWinds to back up the product up until the point where they're ready on a Friday for us to switch over the weekend. We transition into our data center, we power it up VPN. They don't even know the server is not on site. So we've done, we've used SolarWinds for migrational tasks, not just backup and restore recovery situations. We've done it to you. We've used it for shift and lift solutions as well. Awesome. Well, that's a, Hopefully a, a testament to the ease of use then with uh, doing, yeah. uh, you know, making complex tasks rather easy. Yeah. Great. So we've got an another question. Yep. Um, you, you mentioned the speed vault, speed vault a minute ago, and not everyone on the call might know what that is. And so the question uh, came up, um, it's cloud-based backup. Do you use a local NAS for speed vault or how do you do that? Yeah, that's exactly what we do. We have some security protocols built around that. Um, some VLANing to separate that um, that speed vault storage from, uh, again, multi-tenancy is key, right? So we do have some permission sets around that, but we use a, we use a local NAS, large, a very large local NAS 
um, as our speed vault repository for uh, on-site immediate backups is what we do. Great question. I Any hope other... that answered the question. Anyways. <laughs> Yeah, so those are all the questions right now, unless, um, Chris, do you want to maybe just say briefly what the Speed Vault is now it works, just for those who may not be familiar sure. with the term? Yeah, so so one of the unique aspects, uh, well, semi-unique relative to image or appliance-based uh, solutions that you'd find out in the backup spaces is that Enable Backup is, uh, you know, en engineered from day one um, to be a cloud-first backup. So the primary and good copy of your backup is always shooting straight off site in real site and we real time. And we can do that because um, the amount of data that we send on the, on the Delta or the incremental backups um, is typically about like 50 times less than a traditional image uh, backup solution. So it's really, really efficient that way. Then as a secondary option, um, which is recommended is what's called the local speed fault. And that allows you anywhere on the local network um, that you can access like via UNC path, or it can even be directly attached. Um, you can keep a parallel copy of what's on the offsite storage on the local storage, and it will always keep itself in sync. So if, for example, a, an internet connection was disconnected during a backup, it could complete it locally. If uh, that local NAS filled up or got unplugged or you know something happened on the network. Um, backup still runs successfully remote and once that NAS comes back online it'll actually self-heal and um, and that way the reliability of your backups is, is maximized because there's no single point of failure in that whole e ecosystem. That's great. Um, the, the other add-on piece then of course the part that why you do it is because of recovery speed. So if you do uh, for a lot of backups, uh, sorry, for a lot of resource scenarios, if the operating system's still running, you're not actually going to be moving that much data. Um, so, it, you know, there's a, a marginal gain, but if you do lose like a drive or a, like a volume um, where you're going to have to move a bunch of data, obviously doing that over the LAN um, gives you an additional advantage in terms of speed. So that's um, that's where that really comes into play in terms of that benefit. Thus the name. Speed is in the name. There you go. Um, we have a follow-up question related to that same NAS question, and that is one of our attendees is curious specifically what brand and model of device you use for that. Well, that's a great question. That would be an inf I have to ask my infrastructure team. I know that we have a, a QNAP with um, a head unit, like the primary processing unit, and then we have a couple shelves added to it as well with just re retail drives. So that's the that's the beauty of that one. We just use retail drives and don't care if they fail. We just basically, I think we keep it in a RAID 10, but I think we have about 30 drives in the whole thing with the head, head unit plus the expansion drives. Um, and mostly that's just because we also like to keep data to the end of time. So our retention is a little maybe excessive, but um, yeah, so that's kind of what we do is we use QNAPs, Synologies would work as well, a Windows, the reason we use those is because administratively they're less overhead than man managing or maintaining a, like a Windows file server or something like that. The QNAP portion or the Synology portion, we don't make it publicly viewable for management or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it's just for administrative purposes. Very good. Yep, and yeah, there's, there should, uh, it is very light lightweight in terms of the data storage like the requirements in terms of disk speed and so on is um, it's very simple data structure and so mm -hmm. on so um, nothing too fancy required all right well, all right. unless anybody has a last minute question they want to type in that's all i've got for right now yeah no i think we can wrap there that's uh dan really appreciate uh you know all the insights sure. the, uh, the stories um that's uh, uh, really happy uh, to hear, you know, interesting or uh, glad to hear that, that the journey that you want we're on and that it actually, you've uh, found something that has impacted your business like this. So um, we uh, really appreciate no, just, the time today. Yeah, no, yeah, SolarWinds has, fi uh, has uh, fixed that problem. So now we just move on to the next thing, right? So every time the that, that fear disappears, we just decide to tackle a new one, right? So. There's never a shortage of work, I'm sure, or things that could be optimized. Mm -hmm.
All right. Well, and on behalf of Enable, uh, thank you so much. Thank you to the audience for uh, sharing your time with us today. And Thanks, uh, we will uh, catch you guys in the near future, I hope. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.